uh, welcome, guys. Um, just wanted to start off uh, saying, look behind you. Huh? Like, everybody, if you could look behind you. Do you see goodness and mercy? Uh, I know that sounds really dumb, but if I start at that kind of level, everything else will be much better. Uh, in fact, I heard one pastor say, look behind you, and then he said, did you see Shirley, goodness and mercy? Uh, that's even worse. I decided not to start with that. I uh, just went with goodness and mercy and not Shirley. But the point is this, guys. This is really bad huh, for a start. But everything from here on will be, like, much better. And so, <laughs> so guys, uh, but to uh, get serious now, uh, just think of this. Uh, we as a people or a church have not experienced what thousands in the world are experiencing, eh? And I just want to acknowledge his goodness and mercy upon us as a family, that um, we've been kept safe from sickness. Uh, we've been cocooned and insulated under his protective care, under his stripes. And then even though some of us have um, had reduction in the number of hours, uh, perhaps uh, don't um, have a job temporarily, God has been able to provide marvelously for me. The few people that I called off, uh, called up who had layoffs or who were at home who said how well they were provided for. Again, it's a, it's a hand of God. And so I just thought it's time to acknowledge that over the last two months, over the last 60 days, um, God has been really good to this church. Yeah, we've got to acknowledge that. Eh? Surely goodness and mercy has followed us over the last 60 days. He's kept us protected. It's almost like Isaiah 4, verse 2. Let me just read that. Isaiah 4, and then we can start. Isaiah 4, verse 2 onwards, I think. Yeah, it says here, um, verse 3 onwards, Then the Lord will create over all of Acts 29, and over those who as assemble there, a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and the rain. Let me read it from the message. Um, then God will bring back the ancient pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and mark Acts 29 and everyone in it with his glorious presence, his immense protective presence, shade from the burning sun and shelter from the driving rain. And this God has done, eh? This God has done. So Father, we just thank you. I just so want to thank you, O oh God, for taking care of this church, for protecting it, for keeping it safe from sickness and disease and plague, for providing, oh God, even when uh, hours re were reduced and uh, we had to stay away from work, your provision was there. Either you supplied plenty before it happened or you supplied during the famine or you caused hours to increase or you caused things to stay um, the same without any ill effect being felt by any of our families and we give you praise we thank you for provision where you supplied uh, us through each, each other you've been really good to us you've prepared us for a time like this you've been kind and we want to acknowledge it give thanks to the lord for he is good and his steadfast love has endured has endured we give you praise of god can you hear it father in different homes in different rooms now people thanking you and giving you praise for what you've done you've taken care of us through this famine oh god You've taken care of us. It's been Goshen. And we acknowledge you, God of Israel. We acknowledge you, O God of Israel. We acknowledge you. We give you praise, O God, for your kindness to us. Father, we've got nurses on the front line. You've taken care of them. You've protected them. You've kept them safe. You've taken care of our children. You've only been good and we give you praise, O God. We give you praise now. And we acknowledge you in Jesus' name. Amen.
swing wide all you heavens let the praise go up as the walls come down all creation everything with breath repeat the sound all his children clean hands pure hearts good grace good god his name is jesus swing wide all you heavens let the praise go up as the walls come down all creation everything with breath repeat the sound all his children clean as pure hearts good grace good God his name is Habakkuk 3. Habakkuk 3 says, Lord, we have heard of your fame. We stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Lord, we have heard of your fame. We stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. 
in our time make them known, in wrath remember mercy. And I'll just skip to the message for verses three to seven. God's on his way again. He's retracing the old salvation route. Coming up from the south through Temen, the Holy One from Mount Paran, skies are blazing with the splendor. His praise is sounding through the earth, his cloud brightness like dawn, exploding, spreading, forked lightning shooting from his hands. What power hidden in that fist. God's on his way again. He is retracing the old salvation route. He's retracing the old salvation route. So as your goodness multiplies, Father, as your healing multiplies, as your, your works just explode around the globe, may your fame explode with it, Father.
of darkness or they tremble at what they just heard cause all the powers of darkness they can't drown out a single word father we just we sing this because we take you seriously we sing this because we take you seriously i can't remember where where i just read it father but in the message it says Faith can be equated to taking you seriously, and we take you seriously, God. So as we sing these words, we are saying, we're declaring, we take our God very seriously. And all the powers, and all the powers of darkness, they tremble at what they just heard. Cause all the powers of darkness, they can't drown out a single word. Sing it again, church, all the powers. And all the powers of darkness, they tremble at what they just heard. sing this line and as um, as we still keep playing just sing this line what matters to you oh god matters to us yeah what matters to you oh god matters to us so as uh, both the guitar and the drums and the piano play uh, just just sing this line and let god begin to show you his heart because often we say what matters to us matters to god today let's say what matters to you oh god matters to me yeah? So keep playing, guys, as the church sings. Yeah. What 
matters to you, oh God, matters to me. Hear it from a hundred voices right now. What matters to you, oh God, matters to me. Hear it from a thousand tongues across the earth. What matters to you, oh God, matters to me. A thousand hearts now speak. What matters to you, oh God, matters to me. For this reason, I live. What matters to you, oh God, matters to us. For this reason, we live. What matters to you, O oh God, matters to me. This reason, I live. Show us your heart, O oh God. It matters to us. Show. to you, oh God, matters to me. A thousand tongues will now sing. What matters to you, oh God, matters to me. Matters to me, oh God. Oh, yeah,
troubled times Sing when I win I can sing when I lose my step And I fall down again I can sing Cause you pick me up Sing cause I I can sing something I just want to say that I know my praise is always broken and I'm not really proud of my own singing but I'm always really glad for the opportunity to sing to my God because he loves me so much Thanks, Betty. Well done. Um, anyone who sends us one song that you want to do, and the first one who sends it on the chat, we'll sing it. Pardon? Okay. Okay. Anything? Okay. So Jane's just going to do a song then. Yeah. We're not just singing for the sake of singing. I just feel that um, there's, a, there's a simplicity in, uh, uh, in our worship today that uh, God is enjoying. So we'll give him some more simplicity. Yeah. to join the song sung long before our lives to raise our voice alone heaven and earth alike we've come to join we've come to join
marvelous God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. Such a privilege, Lord, to sing those simple lines to you. Highest praises, Lord of all. Highest praises, Lord of all. His majesty unto Jesus be all honor, glory, and praise. Majesty, all kingdom must To your own is anthem raised. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Glorify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. from you are all things to you are all things you deserve the glory you're so worthy of it all you're so worthy of it all Jesus from you are all things to you are all things, you deserve the glory. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. One more time. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. One more time, church. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. One last time. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy. For from you are, for from you are all things, to you are all things, you deserve the glory, for from you are all things, for from you are all things, to you are all things. glory. One 
some announcements and then uh, we'll take a break. Let me get the announcements. For from you are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory. Okay, so a couple of prayer requests, guys. One, Dagmar uh, uh, found out from Anne this week that Dagmar, who was not steady on her feet when she went into uh, Richmond General, uh, this week, uh, with the help of uh, a nurse, started walking, and that was a significant progress. Eh? That means something is healing in the uh, area of the brain that previously was preventing her from walking on her own. She's begun walking, so that was significant. Um, we had prayed last week that a place open up in the uh, home uh, that she was planning to go for physio and stuff like that. It still hasn't opened up. So pray that, oh God, whatever you need to complete at Richmond General, let it happen so that as she goes into this home, she goes with everything that needs to be done already taken care of. So pray again for an opening so that uh, Kamal and Anne and others can start visiting her because at present they can't because of COVID. That is one request. Two, Praful's dad, uh, is going for a surgery tomorrow morning because uh, of certain blocked tubes. So just pray that um, the surgery goes really well, that they make a decision because they're still trying to decide whether or not to make a decision one way or the other. Uh, his name's Prem, P-R-E-M, and um, pray that it goes well, that there be no pain, man, because he was suffering from pain over the last two days, but today it's been much better. Just pray for those two things. And given the condition of hospitals uh, uh, during COVID in India, it becomes very difficult. So just pray that God will undertake like he's undertaken for us and for Praful here. Let him now, uh, let, let that extend to Praful's dad and mom. Yeah, so pray for that. And then, uh, you know, ever since we've spoken about this um, desire of God to bring release on earth, you'll be surprised at how many different difficult Razor hallelujah cases have come our way in the last one week. At least five really uh, serious, difficult, uh, different razor hallelujah cases. Why do I call them razor hallelujah cases? Because uh, I just think God is deliberately sending us, uh, sending it our way so that we can uh, experience what release looks like. And so I'm raising a hallelujah before I even pray for these uh, different needs. And th most of them are from outside of Acts 29. So just wanted to let you know. And then uh, some real good news. Uh, there's just 32 Fridays left for Christmas. 32 Fridays from now, we'll be celebrating Christmas. Isn't that good news? No, nothing there. Okay, let's try the next one. Maybe I'll get some applause. Nine Fridays from now, nine Fridays from now in 60 days, it'll be July 17th. Maya's birthday. No applause for that one, there we go, at least some applause for that. And then uh, one Friday from now, uh, we might actually start meeting together. So, so, uh, <laughs> so initially we might have to uh, um, limit the number of people that come because uh, Pilgrim plans to start uh, on the 31st. But when I spoke to uh, some of the leaders at Pilgrim, they said, that perhaps next week we can have limited numbers as they set the space up because they have to follow, follow protocol because 
they are the hosting church. And so uh, we'll send you an email telling you what the protocol is, what the um, different steps uh, are that we will be required to take to keep with the guidelines prescribed by BC Health and also to make sure that um, all of us um, feel safe. And I realize that some of us um, uh, are in contact with people that are vulnerable, so you may not want to um, attend immediately, and that's under uh, understandable. Some of us may have underlying issues or may feel not very um, healthy, in which case uh, um, take a couple of weeks. Or if you're working in a high-risk area and you think you should or should not come, that's your call too. But anyways, we'll let you know this week in terms of the 24th and the 31st of May. 31st is a sure thing, but next week we can still have more people than we presently have. And uh, some of the house churches may also change the, the way they meet, but you'll get all the info uh, at some point this week. Yeah? Um, hey, guys, uh, this might be one of those last online streaming Sundays. Uh, and so I want to acknowledge uh, Josh. Uh, just, just the amount of stuff he carts every Sunday. Like, uh, uh, I mean, I don't think there's anything left in his house but his wife. Everything else is here. Uh, half the kitchen is here, too, because uh, Charlene sends scones for us. So just want to acknowledge Josh and then Praful. The guy knew n nothing about what he presently is doing, but uh, he's done such a phenomenal job. Every time it's uh, worked well and the sound is good, it's Praful. Every time it's not, it's usually Jeevan. So... Uh, thank you, Praful. <laughs> and then uh, Jane, uh, the way she's uh, brought together worship every Sunday, and she also she still uh, is the parent of Phoebe. Uh, doesn't look like that sometimes when she's here um, w slogging away, but uh, between Sheldon and Jane, um, they've done a marvelous job of taking care of Phoebe and then running worship. So thank you, Jane. Awesome job. Um, then the other guys who are here to help are Don, Derek, uh, Jeevan. Don's learned how to use the zoom on the camera, so I don't have to keep moving up and down. Uh, and May has been such a help, eh? She turns up every Sunday uh, and helps. And then uh, I can't um, stop without uh, expressing gratitude to our wonderful pastor, uh, Jacob. Uh, he's been just so amazing through this season. Eh? <laughs> and thanks again to Betty and Emily and all the others who've made such amazing contributions. Like Aaron, my God, he's a famous pop star now. Check YouTube out. Just type in Aaron and see what happens. Uh, so thank you. And the Go Canucks Go. Alrighty, the next thing is uh, lots of announcements today because we don't have anything else to add to the service today, but we don't want to fail you by stopping the service within two hours. So uh, there'll be a new series on favor uh, and release that we'll start just like open up your ancient doors. So watch out for that. Uh, we got a new Facebook uh, page that's open to public. So... If you want to direct people to a Facebook page, um, check the details out at Expression, which is a closed group. We got a blog. Check out the blog. Some of the stuff written on the blog, I thought to myself, oh, shucks, didn't know these guys had that much buddhi. Buddhi is Greek for, like, spiritual intelligence. So, um, and then uh, in the future, we won't live stream worship, but we might still record the teaching so that others around the world can watch. I uh, wanted to read out a scripture that Josh sent me. Um, let me just grab my phone. Can you grab my phone? Uh, and I'm going to read it out, and I pray, God, that it blesses you, because it might be a word in season for somebody. It's from Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. And I'm reading from the message. Isaiah 43. 16 to 21. Isaiah 43, 16 to 21. 
I just got a text from someone at Acts 29 saying that Pastor Jacob is so humble, he never mentions himself. <laughs> Reading from Isaiah 43, verse 16 to 21, uh, from the message. Uh, so made minister to more than one or two people as you hear it. This is what God says. The God who builds a road right through the ocean, who carves a path through pounding waves. The God who summons horses and chariots and armies, they lie down and then they can't get up. They are snuffed out like so many candles. And this is a bit that I really think is for some of us. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert for you. Rivers in the badlands. Wild animals will say thank you, coyotes and buzzards, because I provided water in the desert, rivers through sun-baked earth, drinking water for the people I chose, the people I made especially for myself. I love this next line, a people custom made to praise me. So let me read a couple of lines that really stand out for me. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert for you. The people I made for myself a people custom made to praise me. Yeah? On that note, we'll take a break for about three to four minutes, and then we'll come back with the teaching. <laughs> a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. I wear Hallelujah Heaven comes to fight 
Hey guys, before we uh, start the teaching, there's a 20 year old kid called um, uh, Danny who's been taken to Richmond General right now as we speak because he's got some uh, problems with his digestive system, liver, gallbladder, and he's in pain. So can we just pray for that? And then Karuna's friend, Ankit, uh, 30 year old, uh, has ovarian cancer and she was supposed to meet us for prayer today, but had to be rushed to. Uh, VGH with excruciating pain. So let's just pray for these two. Yeah, Father, we're going to talk about your release and your favor. You said that you have come uh, and then have caused your spirit now to dwell upon us to set the morally and spiritually oppressed free, to set the captive free, to open blind eyes, to uh, set prisoners free, to uh, bring comfort to those who are in despair and who are mourning, uh, to bring release. And so we bring um, both Danny and this lady called Ankit before you right now, both in pain right now, oh God. Father, prayer has never, we've never needed to use prayer to coax you. We just use prayer to agree with you and your nature. And we agree with you right now that it is your pleasure to intervene in Danny's situation, bringing him relief from pain, healing him. He knows you, Lord. And then this other lady who's willing to call out to you for help, even though she is not a believer or a Christian. In both cases, we thank you for your marvelous intervention. This is your nature. Who can stop you? This is who you are. What else can you do? This is who you are. So we thank you, Father, for your arrival and your intervention in the scene, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Okay, guys. So um, let's just go back to last week and then trace where we were at and then move from there, uh, move forward from there. So we said last week that God uh, is bringing forth release upon the earth. He's bringing forth release upon the earth. And uh, this release will take the form of unparalleled kindness. It will take the form of God restraining The devil, even though wickedness will increase, even though wickedness on the earth will increase, even though there'll be exploitation, there'll be uh, wickedness, God will restrain the devil, God will show unparalleled kindness, and God will cause Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, to break forth through us. This is what we said last week. And that this would go on for two and a half to three years. And that a church or churches that begin to step up to seed the earth with this release will see a harvest and will be tremendously blessed. We also said that this release used to happen once every 50 years at a time called Jubilee. Or another word for Jubilee was year of the favor of the Lord. And one of the things God wants to do is to say to the earth that you don't have to wait for 49 years or 5 years or 6 years or 7 years, I am your jubilee. Jesus Christ is the jubilee. And when he unrolls that scroll in Luke chapter 4 in the synagogue, he reads and says uh, the year of favor. And we said last time, last week, that God will, it'll be a time of favor and of vengeance. That's where we stopped last week. So today, we pick up 
on this idea. Year of favor. That's where we'll go. So if you want to title this teaching anything, call it Year of the Lord's Favor. What does that look like? Because we last week we stopped at this point where we said that there's favor and there's vengeance. And vengeance upon the enemy, a restraining of him, and favor upon people released through churches that want to stand up and say, hey, look at what God's going to do, unparalleled kindness. So today we'll talk about this idea of the of favor. So here are some questions we need to consider. Um, what does the year of favor look like? What will it look like? As I said, it'll look like unparalleled kindness. Uh, write this down almost like an equation on your uh, page, eh? That Okay, so the year of the f year of favor or release will be unparalleled kindness. It will it'll be restraining of Satan. Even though the world will increase in wickedness, God will restrain Satan from bringing harm to the earth. And that Isaiah sixty one, opening the eyes of the blind, opening eyes, prison, captivity. Release from moral and spiritual bondage. Uh, comfort to those in despair and sorrowing. These are the things that God wants to do for the next two and a half to three years. Isn't it awesome that we get to be a part of who God is? Because this is who he is. So, if this is what the year of release of favor looks like, the next question you need to ask is, what will it take for fa favor to flow through us? What will it take for favor to flow through us? What will it take for favor to flow through Acts 29? I can't hear you. Sorry, Diana, just speak up. Just kidding. It's one of those days when jokes are really falling flat. So what will it take for favor to flow through us? For favor to flow through us, guys, we have to learn how to walk in favor and in this idea of release. If we don't know what it tastes like, if we don't savor it as a lifestyle, how can we release it to others? We have to be a people who uh, are a people of favor, which means we have to understand what it is to be fully forgiven, and we have to understand what it is to be highly favored. If we don't understand this, then we are not able to give to others what God wants to give. Anytime God wants to do something on earth, he does call forth a people. But when people come excitedly to him saying, sure, sure, use us, use us, God says, okay, let's start training. It's always been that way. And so as we step up and say, oh God, let this be so, God is saying, okay, then can you learn how to walk in my favor so that favor can flow through you? And can you become a community or a people who are fully forg forgiven and highly favored. Fully forgiven, highly favored. We talked about what it is to be fully for forgiven long ago, eh? so I won't go there. Uh, but what it is, what is it to walk as highly favored ones? What is it to walk as highly favored ones? Uh, uh, why is it that we don't walk in this constant awareness of God's favor? Different reasons. One of the reasons we aren't aware of God's constant favor is because we lack an understanding. We lack understanding. Or um, if it's not a lack of understanding, it's a lack of thinking and walking in it. Guys, I don't walk 
consciously aware of favor. I'm surprised at the number of times I ask God for favor. I'm surprised at the number of times I ask God for favor. I'm surprised at the number of times I prayed favor for you. Sometimes we don't think much of favor because we get a whole lot of trinkets and baubles from uh, men, and that suffices, as in a few positions here, a little bit of recognition there, and we think that is favor, and we, and we, uh, and we um, just gloat in it when God's favor is far more excessive. Sometimes we don't know what favor is because it's been robbed. Satan loves robbing us of favor. God the Father loves robing us with favor. Satan loves robbing us of favor. He tried this with Joseph. The father robes, Satan robs. And then finally, sometimes some of us have received favor, but what happens in Christendom is very often favor becomes an entitlement. And when that happens, like it says in Deuteronomy uh, 6, verse 10 to 12, God warns them saying, listen, I've given you wells that you did not dig, vineyards you did not plant. I gave you houses that you did not build. Once you begin to live there, do not forget who I am. And people did. Jesus, on the other hand, had tremendous favor. But in Philippians 2, verse 69, instead of uh, seeing himself entitled to favor, Jesus actually emptied himself out. These are the different reasons why I don't walk in favor, you don't walk in favor. Why? Favor is not like breathing for us. And so, just want to launch into this idea of what favor really looks like. So here goes. Before I start defining favor, just listen to this. The father wants the same relationship with you that he presently has with Jesus. The father wants the same relationship with me that he presently has with Jesus. And he's relentless in his wanting this. He doesn't get put off that I'm not interested. He doesn't get put off that I turn away. He doesn't get put off that I sometimes serve the father of lies. He doesn't get put off that my interest fluctuates. He doesn't get put off that sometimes my heart is fickle. Because he is relentless in wanting the same relationship with me that he presently has with Jesus. How does he go about this? He goes about it by loving me right now like he loves Jesus and never slacking off or holding it back. He goes about this relentless pursuit by loving me right now as I stand here and speak to you just as he loves Jesus. He does not hold it back. He's continuously pouring it out, trusting that it will be powerful enough to become first a distraction, then something that draws me and then becomes my default. That aside, he also bestows on me right now the favor that Jesus presently enjoys and has always enjoyed. He bestows on me the favor that Jesus enjoys. I would suggest to you that none of us actually on a daily basis think that this is our existence. That one, the Father wants the same relationship he presently has with Jesus with you. Two, that right now he makes sure that he has the same love for you that he has 
for Jesus who is seated at his right hand. And that he is bestowing upon me the same favor that Jesus has always had. If I thought like this, I'd be very different. But I don't think like this. So let's kind of define favor. Favor is approval. As in, when I wake up in the morning, the first words he wants to say to me is, Hey, Jacob, you've just woken up. Before you do anything else today, I want you to know that you're already approved in my sight. Children experience it. Babies experience it. Once they grow up and can talk, it begins to wear off. But God wakes, the moment I wake up, God's first comment, if he could make one, and if I was listening, was, hey, before you start the day, I just want you to know that you're fully approved. This is what favor looks like. Another word that you can use when you talk about favor is uh, esteem. As in honor. If you read Isaiah 43, um, verse 3 and 4 from the message, it says, you're highly honored, you're precious, you're beloved. I'll give up nations for you. You are so, you, this is how much I love you. I would give up nations for you. You're precious, you're honored. Jacob is highly honored, esteemed by the creator of the universe. It doesn't even compute sometimes. Huh? Delight. These are all words that kind of begin uh, to... These are divine synonyms for favor. Delight. He would love to constantly say, I'm well pleased and delighted with you. That... I've got to take this teaching slow because I want to experience it too. I just don't want to teach it. That um, the Father actually has great pleasure in me. He is thrilled that I responded to his love and decided to follow him. And that my pursuit of him has been pretty sincere. He's thrilled at it. Gives him great pleasure. Brings him delight. Next one. Highly loved. Highly loved. We talk about being much loved children, and that's from our end. And uh, that's from our end, much loved children. From his end too, there's this idea of being highly loved. Jacob, you are highly loved. Highly loved. I remember once walking into a meeting in some uh, small town outside of Seattle, and as, as soon as I walk in, this man who was uh, prophesying says, uh, looks at me and says, what's your name? And uh, I said, Jacob. He said, Jacob, you are special to God. You're highly loved. I remember bawling from that moment on for the next two hours. Demonstrated kindness. Demonstrated kindness. Not biblical kindness as in hiding in the Bible. This is kindness that is evidenced through a demonstration of ways that God puts into motions so that I actually experience his kindness. I think this is the advantage of living uh, longer. You can look back and see so many incidents of tremendous kindness. demonstrated kindness. And you don't have to go looking uh, three months ago, two months ago. You can look yesterday and I can think of uh, just fabulous kindness from God. This is favor. The odd thing about favor, remember how I started the service looking for Shirley? Um, it's this idea of kindness of God following you. Favor follows you. It surrounds you. Access. Favor gives you access. If you have favor with uh, a king, you have access to his courts. Remember the uh, place where 
King Xerxes stretches out his scepter so that Esther can enter. And he prevents Vashti from entering, but he allows um, Esther to enter because she had favor. Favor gives you access. We'll talk about each of these when we do the series on favor, just like opening up your ancient doors. Each of these words we'll explore. Because the people who can walk in this kind of favor, their language will change, their prayer will change, the way they conduct their lives will change, their response will change, their intimacy will change, uh, their battle and the way of battling the enemy will change. It is such a such a, such a powerful, important part of who we are with into God, and yet we don't walk in it. I love this next word. It's not mine. Intentional bias. Intentional bias. God has an intentional bias towards me. God has an intentional bias. It's not by mistake. He has an intentional bias towards me. He can pick me out of a line and be biased towards me. There's an intentional bias. Here's another one. You may not believe this, but I'm beginning to believe this. He often wants to say, if you will listen, that you, you're my favorite. You're my favorite. And there are days when it's absolutely true. You're my favorite. When I say there are days when it's absolutely true, what I meant is there are days when I actually know that is true. Every day he says it, he's, he's sincere about it. Then there are extra benefits. If there's favor, there's always extra benefits. Like it's not standard benefits, it's extra, it's bonus. If there's favor, there's a settling of my outstanding debts. There's a settling of my outstanding debts. As in, when I favor somebody, if I found out that they owed someone 20 bucks, I'd pull out 20 bucks and pay it off because I favor the person. There's an outstanding debt settlement that comes with favor. And then the last one is tailor-made or bespoke goodness or tailor-made goodness. As in, there's goodness that he tailor-makes for you because he knows what gets your mojo going. And so he tailor-makes it for you. Tailor-made goodness. So let me put it this way. Favor is the goodness favor is the goodness and kindness of god given ungrudgingly because he simply adores you because he simply adores you this is not the kind of adores you as in adoration but adores you as in but I I what, what do you do with these words what word can you use favor is God's goodness and kindness given to me ungrudgingly in Christ, because of Christ, ungrudgingly, given to me ungrudgingly. For the rest of my life, for a lifetime. Why? Because he simply adores me. Do you know what this could do to my life? It would ruin me if I actually came into grips with this. It would make it impossible to escape God. It would make it impossible to escape this way of thinking. 
You will not be able to escape favor when you think like this. You will anticipate favor in every circumstance. You will anticipate favor in every circumstance. But after all this, I can still miss out on this because I will not find time this week to understand it, to think about it. And so it will be words I parrot, parrot, but I do not experience because I cannot find the time to understand or think about it. You always inhabit what you think. Please don't forget that. There's just no other way around it. Truth is learned through repetition. You inhabit what you think. To think is to, is to ponder on something with the help of the Holy Spirit so that it goes deep into spirit and affects the soul. Think is not repeating these words to me. I have to think to come up with these words that explain him. I could give you scriptures for each of these words. Yeah. Any questions before we go on? May I not be caught not thinking about this because if I don't, uh, it'll be one of the best messages I've ever preached, but it won't be my experience. We are on to something, guys. When we were singing one of the songs, I thought, Father, I just want to go up there and remind the church that you're going to affect the earth through us. And I decided not to because um, Jane was d saying something that was uh, more profound. So I thought, okay, I'll talk about it later. But uh, that's one of the things we need to understand is uh, if we go down this route, uh, life will change. Any questions? Have you noticed in this whole list, there's nothing about earning, deserving, um, nothing. Good question. How can we all be God's favorite? The simple logical answer is just mind-boggling. Because Christ is in you. And you are in Christ. And Christ is God's beloved son. You are therefore as favored, as loved, as special as Christ himself. And therefore, you become highly favored. There's no separation. We are heirs of everything that God has and co-heirs with Christ. It's fascinating that that's the answer. That in Christ I find favor. I am both in him and he is in me. Everything about the father is attracted to the son. And today the son is in me and I am in the son. Whatever belongs to the son is mine. And anyways, I was loved to begin with. But in the Son, it goes far beyond just being loved, being redeemed, being ransomed. It goes far beyond that. Listen to this verse in Romans 8.32. Won't he who gave up his Son now freely give us all things? So let's continue down this road with figuring out, okay, so what else does favor look like? Yep. Yeah, this is very powerful. How does our prayer change before and after understanding favor? Um, many of the things that you stand in faith for will no longer be required once you know favor. The language of prayer will change too because you will now uh, operate from a place of knowing uh, what is yours 
in God because of his heart towards you. The goodness of God will become more and more evident. Every promise from the word will carry in it uh, favor, provision, goodness, release. Uh, if you are all that we said you are, uh, the confidence you have in God will grow like crazy, like it'll escalate. Striving will become less. Outcomes will take on a guarantee. Not of this is what I want, but I am so sure of the goodness of God in this circumstance. It is now unavoidable. Promises will carry the heart of God in them. If God has said it, either through a rhema word or through the word, it must come to pass. You become confident of this. Prayer changes completely. And remember, guys, you don't always need a prophetic word for a promise. Some promises are in the word. You don't need an extra word for it. Run with what is in the word. To all the single people, all the single people, I say to you, you don't need a prophetic word. <laughs> what you need is a simple word from Proverbs which says, he who finds a wife or a husband finds a good thing. Go to the book of Genesis and you'll hear God saying, it is not good for man to be alone except Jacob. And Derek. <laughs> that sunk his boat. All righty. <laughs> and Derek's dad's boat. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we'll come to that later if we have time. Because I want to talk about promises. If we get through favor. So, here are some really cool thoughts um, about favor that I want you to look at. Favor is access to the ultimate place. Favor is access to the ultimate place of relationship. I love this. I'll tell you why. Favor is access to the ultimate place of relationship. Why? Because I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. But that makes it sound like just scripture. Think of, think of it this way. In John 13, 23, you have um, John leaning against uh, Jesus, head on Jesus' chest. Uh, that boy had tremendous favor. Like I've said before, he probably uh, met Jesus when he was 13 or 14. Lived longer than most of the others. And so Jesus had a special place for John. John would call himself the beloved disciple. And so he's reclining with his head on Jesus' chest. What we need to understand is that favor is an open door into intimacy. Favor is an open door into intimacy. Like um, I remember um, with my uh, nieces, um, especially with uh, Hannah, she was the youngest one. Um, uh, she had favor with me. There's another kid called Diego, a uh, five-year-old, son of one of my uh, good friends, and uh, Diego has tremendous favor with me. Favor opens the door to intimacy. The more I realize how favored I am, the more easy it is to run despite what yesterday must have been, to run through an open door into his arms becomes easy when there is favor. Because favor gives me access to the ultimate place in relationship. Second, favor is the fullness of permission to 
adventure into everything Christ has. Favor is the fullness of permission you actually have to adventure into everything that Christ has. Again, I take you to Romans 8.32. If he who freely, freely gave us, uh, if he freely gave us his son, will he not freely give us everything else? Romans 8.32. Okay. What about growing in favor like Jesus did? It is we who grow into favor. It is not God who increases his favor. We grow into favor by understanding this, thinking about it, practicing it, walking in it, using favor as a door into intimacy. Do you think of all the 12 disciples, John had any problem barging into Jesus' house any time of the day? Even Peter, who would stumble into things, would perhaps have been a bit careful. Not John. To the point that John probably knew Jesus' home and relatives so well that Jesus had absolutely no problem turning to John at the cross and saying, Hey, here's your mom. Take care of her. Man, once you begin to realize the favor that God has upon you, your heart will begin to take advantage and move into intimacy. So we grow in favor, not because God is increasing his favor, but because we are exploring or plumbing the depths of this amazing uh, uh, approach or attitude of goodness that God has towards us. Do um, unbelievers have favor? Uh, they do, but they don't realize it because uh, they belong to another father and their spirits are dull. The Bible says that God sends rain and causes his son to fall both on the good and the evil. But um, someone who does not know Christ is never able to receive it, recognize it, walk in it, respond to it. And if you can't receive, recognize, and respond to favor, now how do you even uh, quantify it? Favor is the fullness of permission to adventure into everything Christ says. One of the best examples I can give is, uh, unfortunately, by, uh, in, a, in a moment of weakness and uh, uh, error, I gave Jeevan the code to my um, uh, home and uh, the keys to my home. And so now what has happened is he now assumes that he has the fullness of permission to adventure into my home at will. And um, sometimes when I come out of my room, Jeevan's sitting there. Because he can let himself in. There are times when he feels like he needs to cook lunch on my stove, which I never use. It's called the fullness of permission to adventure into everything Jacob has. Only in this case, we now get, uh, God is saying, hey, but don't you know you're highly favored, Jacob? Don't you know that you get extra benefits? Don't you know that you're approved before you start your day? Don't you know that um, my delight uh, likes uh, just tenting on you? Uh, don't you know that you think you're much loved? I think you're highly loved. Don't you know that every day I find ways to demonstrate my kindness to you, whether you recognize it or not? Don't you know that you have access to everything that is in Christ. Don't you know that I have an intentional bias towards you? Haven't you seen that often enough? Don't you know that you're my favorite? There are days I know you've felt that. Don't you know that I've settled so many of your outstanding debts, spiritual, physical, material, relational, financial? Don't you know that I've tailor-made goodness for you? When you know all that, why will I not allow you to adventure into everything that Christ has for you? Come, Jacob, explore, explore. Jacob, you're so hesitant. You're always concerned about, am I good enough? Am I holy enough? How did yesterday go? Those things are important, but it always holds you back. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, where he said, 
Corinthians, we've opened our hearts to you, but your hearts are too small to receive our love. Jacob, I want to say the same thing to you. I've opened my heart to you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have opened our hearts to you. But your heart is too small to receive that love, and therefore there is still distance and hesitation. Won't you begin to explore this idea of favor and step into all that I am? Part of the idea is that favor is the confidence I have in my deficits that Christ's benefits will f take over. Uh, uh, let me rephrase uh, it properly. Favor is the confidence I have. Favor is the confidence I have. Favor is the confidence I have that the benefits of Christ will fill my deficits. You know, long ago, before we became a mega church, when uh, Acts 29 was really small, I think four or five people, I was invited to a, a large church. Um, and they asked me to preach, and it was like a golden opportunity. And so I went with a whole lot of props and a, even a sheep, because um, I wanted to really illustrate my uh, sermon very well. You guys have no idea what you have been spared can you imagine me bringing a sheep into the church? Um, so I go there, and everything with the teaching went wrong. Eh? It was such a flop in my mind. And so um, I knew it's, it stank. And so I went home. I used to live in Richmond then, and I remember standing on the balcony looking out and saying, Oh, God, what an opportunity. And I just blew it completely. I just beat myself up for about two hours. And then finally I turned to God and say, said, uh, what do you think about it? What do you think of what happened tonight? And I felt God saying, go stand out in the balcony. It was dark by now. I went stood out in the balcony. He said, look up. And I look up. And uh, it, there was this uh, clear sky. And then as I would watch, clouds would come. And wherever there was a gap, the clouds would just fill that gap. And I'm looking at it for a while. And then I hear the voice of God as clear as day. And he says, Jacob, remember something. I'll always cover the gaps for you. I'll always cover the gaps for you. And I've never forgotten that. Eh? I just started bawling because that's a very natural thing for me to do. Um, I, 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 and I've never forgotten that. That was about 15 years ago, man. And whenever I've done a miserable job, and every so often that happens, I know that the deficits, the um, lack, the inadequacies are being compensated by no other than the Spirit of God himself and that the gaps are covered. Paul caught this when he said, um, in, I boast in my infirmities and in my weakness, for when I am weak, then he is strong and his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient not like a little cookie that is given to a kid who's been craving for more, but grace is sufficient as in it fills the gap completely. It levels the depression. This is what favor does. These are confidences that we have to build up. Because then we won't try to compensate it ourselves. We won't try to compensate it ourselves. I love this next line. Um, I wrote it, I thought, huh, that came out well. Favor, there's no favor there. Favor is being condemned to generosity. Favor is being condemned to generosity, as in <laughs> God's favor condemns me to God's generosity. As in, I'm written off into generosity. And the moment I say generosity, do not think dollars. Uh, if God's generosity was only limited to dollars, what would I do about forgiveness? What would I do about kindness? What would I do about a million second chances? What would I do, man? His generosity is his goodness profusely being poured out upon me again and again and again. Pfft. 
please go home and think about these things. Grow in it. Like the question asked, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God. How? The boy thought. So favor is being condemned to generosity. And this generosity is preferential, as in you are preferred over others. This generosity is uh, undeserved. And this generosity just breaks my heart in a good way. And if you haven't experienced it, then know that there is another level of living that you and I need to enter into. Favor is being condemned to God's generosity. And guys, this is not when there's a crisis. This is not when there's a difficult situation or when uh, there's a Good Friday and Easter and Christmas. Uh, no, no, no. This is every day. Every day. To get up in the morning knowing, ah, shucks, man, I am condemned. Really? What are you condemned to? To God's ridiculous generosity today. What did you do to earn it? Nothing, man. Totally undeserving. And like, uh, what else? It's preferential, man. It's like the special card you get, preferential card, where you go through doors that others can't go through. It's preferential. It is under, undeserved. And every time that happens, it just melts my heart. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. I'll tell you some of the things that happen in terms of condemned to generosity on a daily basis. I'll be asking God a question, and as soon as I finish the question, there'll be a truck going past my door with my answer. A bowl letters on it. Huh? And I'll, uh, b before I even um, savor the answer, it is, why do you do this? Who are you? Who am I? Don't you have other stuff to do? Do you have to respond immediately? Can't you take time? Aren't we supposed to tarry for the Lord through the night? Why do you respond so quickly? Being aware of favor allows you to spot and recognize favor quickly. You know, it's odd. When you buy a car, you notice other cars like yours on the road. Till then, they didn't exist. But the moment you buy it, like when I bought my bike, which I go cycling around Vancouver, now I recognize bikes all over the place. Before that, never had that experience. If a question comes saying, what bike do you have? Just feel free to answer it however you want. Here's another one. Favor is permission to flourish and overflow. Favor is permission to flourish and overflow. Favor is permission to flourish and overflow. He commands extravagance upon you. He commands extravagance upon you. Because of stupid theologies, that make God out to be a miser who's recycling things here on earth. We never even consider the possibility, possibility that favor is permission to flourish. And flourish does not mean a million to me. Flourish could mean $300 to give away. Flourish to Bill Gates could mean three billion to give away. Flourish to someone in India could mean 300 rupees, which is $6 to give away. But favor gives you permission to flourish and overflow. And overflow. I love that after the word flourish comes the word overflow. Because once I flourish, it is supposed to overflow. Anything that is poured into a cup past a certain point spills over the brim. My cup runs over. Favor causes your cup to run over. Unless you're taking your cup and keep putting it into bigger cups, that's the only way you won't flourish. Whenever things come into your life, let it go out. Jesus did this. Entitled to tremendous favor and glory, he decided that, nah, I'll let this overflow. 
God has a desire to prosper us. John, uh, 3 John, what's the scripture? Um, 3 John chapter 1 verse 2. Uh, if you read it from the message, I love the way it writes it in the message. 3 John Three John, one verse two. Uh, no, three John. Is it three John one two? Um, yeah, the pastor to my good friend Gaius. How truly I love you. We are the best of friends. And I pray for good fortune in everything you do and for your good health, that your everyday affairs prosper as well as your soul. Love it, eh? That your everyday affairs prosper. Maybe you're growing tomatoes. I, I, I wouldn't understand why. But you begin to prosper. Your garden begins to prosper. Your cooking begins to prosper. We, we, we limit prosperity to dollars and cents because our minds are so trapped in what the world says is prosperity. There's a question? Oh, pardon? Oh, you grow tomatoes too. I thought you grow corn, uh, Jeevan, and that you then can the corn that you grow. I mean, when you look at Isaiah 61, verse 5 to, five, uh, verse, uh, five to 7 and verse 9, uh, this is the old covenant, and look what God says he'll do for his children. Isaiah 61, provision will be supplied. Security will be restored. Double honor will be bestowed. Promises will be fulfilled. Debt and bondage will be reversed. Priests will be clothed. Generations will be blessed. Work will be fruitful. Does that sound like prosperity? Does that sound like the favor of God? Receive it, church. There's an expectation one should have there. Like I said, I don't know who came up with this phrase, but it's so true. We, we inhabit what we think. Is this not your way of thinking? It's going to be very hard to recognize things when they happen. Someone gave me what felt like Ferraro Rocher. It was wrapped up very nicely, and I felt it, and felt like Ferraro Rocher, and I f it felt like three of them. And uh, I am not a Ferraro Rocher guy, so I gave it to someone else. Recycled the gift without opening it. And I went to visit this person who I didn't know too well and gave it to them because that person was just an acquaintance and I gave them the Ferrara Roche. I gave it to them and the next time I went to visit them, they were just gushing. They were just so moved by my generosity and kindness. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, three Ferrara Roche go a long way. What I didn't know was there was a gift certificate for 50 bucks that was wrapped around the Ferrara Roche. And now this guy couldn't understand why Jacob, a mere acquaintance, was giving him a $50 gift certificate. And when I found out, you have no idea how regretful I felt. Why? Because when you do not think a certain way, you do not receive, recognize, inhabit that place. So nowadays I open every gift before I re-gift it. So guys, begin to focus on God's favor and goodness. Huh? And one of the ways uh, to go about this on a regular basis, which I've been uh, practicing now for a few weeks, is I speak back God's favor to him. As in, uh, I I'll, I'll focus on favor and then I'll say, because you favor me. This is how you are towards me. This is how you will respond because you favor me. I speak back his favor towards me, coming into agreement with him. I speak back his favor and his goodness. And what happens then is you propel yourself into 
a place of rest, you propel yourself into a place of rest when you speak back his favor to him. As in, Father, uh, I got this pain on the left lower back or uh, pain in the hip or pain in the knee. Um, let's just stick with left lower back right now because for me, that's real. And so uh, before I even come to you for prayer, I just want to acknowledge how highly favored I am, how uh, your goodness is something you want uh, to break into my life on a continuous basis, how you have an intentional bias towards me, how your promise carries your heart and your favor and your goodness for me, and your promise is that the son of righteousness rises with healing in his wings. Your promise is that by the stripes that your son bore, I am healed. Your promise is that into this deficit of the weakness and the pain in my back will come the benefit of Christ. And Christ's benefit is healing. Knowing all this, Father, I just agree with you. And I speak back your favor upon me, absolutely confident of the outcome, simply because of your goodness and your faithfulness. Now you suddenly get placed into a, 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 a field of rest instead of a field of striving and faith. I remember, maybe I've shared it with some of you one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, as I share this, I think my sister, if she's listening, will get a shock, as will my mom. Uh, but so be it. Unless my sister and my mom have cut their ears. So some years ago, because of my own fault and because of an unfair um, um, dealing, I had to pay back $26,000 in 12 days. And we weren't a mega church then, and we didn't have the private jet, so it was not like we could sell that either. So... I had to pay $26,000 off in 12 days, and I didn't know how. And I decided I would not uh, steal, uh, and uh, that um, would not beg. And so I remember panicking because I was so scared. Um, and then I was pacing up and down in my living room and asking God, Father, uh, what does your goodness, your favor, your your heart say towards me? And he gave me a scripture from Second Kings 19 um, where it's, it talks about uh, how even though they have laid a siege against you and built siege mounds against you and they have archers ready to shoot, I want you to know that not a single arrow will be shot. The city will not be taken. And in the way he came, he will return. And I realize that God is saying, don't worry about it. No one will come after you. You'll get whatever needs to be gotten. Even though they put a siege mound around you, don't look at it. I don't know how it happened, man. In 12 days, I started getting money from all over the place. I was $1,000 short. And I remember <laughs> thinking, gosh, Lord, you did amazingly well. I was quite happy. And then uh, I, I had to meet Heidi and Chris at uh, Himalaya. Uh, that restaurant, uh, there are these things called restaurants. They, they are these large rooms with tables and chairs where you can sit and eat, if you don't remember. So uh, I was at Himalaya, and as we're leaving, Chris suddenly pulls out a check for a thousand bucks and gives it to me. And uh, she had no idea what she was doing. Here I was thanking God for Father, you provided most all of it. And he's thinking, really? That's how I do stuff? Sometimes it's important, guys to begin to say back to him the things that you know he has said out of his favor. This was my own fault, eh? Sure, I was treated unfairly in the bargain, but it was my fault. I was at fault. And yet God's favor broke through. If favor only happened when you are not at fault, then favor would never happen because you're always at fault. You know, I'm scared to abandon myself to this kind of thinking. It'll take away all striving. It'll, life will become too easy. You know, I, I love this line that I heard from somewhere, and I, I'm applying it to myself right now. I'm living below my privilege. 
I am living below my privilege. And it is bothersome that I do not inhabit this place really. I do not. That's been the most bothersome thing about this teaching, that I do not inhabit this place of favor, that I'm living well below my privilege, and that somehow I'm scared to abandon myself to thinking like this. But I want to so badly. And guys, when you start this process, one of the things Satan does is he tries to bury favor alive by delaying things. Favor is often buried alive by delay because Satan fights to retard favor or to hinder favor from breaking through. So here you are waiting for this sure thing called the heart of God towards you in favor. And somehow even though it's there, there is, there is a hindering or a retarding of its progress. And so you bury it alive saying, ah, this might work once in a while, not always. This is why we are scared to abandon ourselves to this kind of thinking, guys. Because if we abandon ourselves to this kind of thinking, rest will kick in because you don't strive anymore. What will you do if you can't strive? What will happen to us self-made men? And if you're thinking of a question, but doesn't God want us to work? Yes, after he tells us what to do. Remember, guys, one of the things Satan loves doing is uh, uh, s devouring or stripping you of favor and uh, blessing. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So walking in favor is critical to battle, too. Walking in favor is critical to battle. An awareness of God's favor, an awareness of goodness is critical in warfare because that's exactly what the devourer tries to strip off you. But if you know that the sun is going to stand still, if you know that Jericho has been given over to you, if you know that you don't even need five stones, but you're just going to pick five stones because it feels good to just twirl them in your hand. If you know that you don't need armor, if you know that this snake that has just bitten me uh, is harmless and I can shake it off, if you know that not a single life will be lost in the shipwreck. If you know the favor and the goodness of God. <laughs> Can you imagine the advantage it gives you? This I have experienced, the favor of God in battle. It makes you unafraid to take Jericho. It makes you unafraid to shake the serpent off your hand and keep preaching as if it was a mosquito bite. Um, Betty is asking a question. What does it mean to be entitled to God's favor? Um, you are entitled to God's favor, but when favor becomes an entitlement, it becomes all about you. When favor is supposed to pour into you, and then overflow. So you are entitled to favor. I am entitled to my inheritance. Again, unfortunately, Jeevan has stuck his foot in there too. But I am entitled to my inheritance. But when my inheritance becomes an entitlement that I will not share with my sister or with others, because I now own it and it is mine, then it becomes a problem. And in this, Jesus is our role model. And Philippians 2, verse 6 to 9, where it talks about emptying. Empty your favor, man. Create room for more. Favor doesn't increase because it's constant and Christ is in you and it's constant. But 
You can increase your capacity to receive favor by causing it to flow out. You increase your capacity to receive favor by allowing it to flow out. Every time you cause the favor that's poured into you to flow out, you increase in capacity to receive more. I don't know whether to stop here or not. L let me just let me just touch on maybe two or three points more, and then I'll stop. I won't finish the whole thing because we'll be doing this anyways in a twelve minute, uh, seven to twelve minute um, thingies. Such a cool word, a thingy. It just takes care of everything. Guys, uh, these words are connected. Favor, presence, glory, goodness, promise, provision. All these words are connected. These, these, these words are the ingredients for release. If you want release in your life or you want to bring release into somebody else's life, these words uh, are uh, all connected. Uh, if you go to Exodus uh, 33, verse 13 to 19, Exodus 33, 13 to 19. Exodus 33, 13 to 19. Um, reading from the NIV. If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do everything you have asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on who I will have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. No one may see it and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock when my glory passes by you. I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I'll remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face uh, may not be, must not be seen. So, um, when you connect to favor, when you connect to favor, You become conscious of presence. In this, in this uh, passage between Moses and God, a conversation between Moses and God, this is what is happening. He knows he has favor. Uh, his favor then begins to, uh, because he connects with God's favor, he, uh, he is in a place where he's conscious of God's presence to the point where He's saying, hey, if your presence doesn't go with us, it doesn't matter whether you send an angel or whether you send Jethro or whether you send a guy smarter than me, I ain't going. So uh, when you connect to favor, you become conscious of presence. When you are conscious to presence, your eyes are wide open. Your eyes are wide open to his glory. Because once you connect to presence, your eyes are wide open to what is otherwise concealed glory. Your eyes get wide open to what is concealed glory, as in, okay, God, 
I'm so connected with your favor that it is impossible to escape your presence now. I'm so aware of you because I, I know what favor looks like. I'm so aware of you now. And as I become aware of you, my eyes open to how just ridiculously glorious you are. And once my eyes open to his glory, guess what happens? It increases my awareness of his goodness. Because your God, the glory of your God is his goodness. The glory of your God is always his goodness. The glory of your God is his goodness. The glory of your God is his goodness. He delights to be good to me. His goodness follows me every day. Psalm 23 verse 6, his goodness follows me every day. I must expect and explore his goodness and favor every day. I must expect. I don't walk in expectation of his favor every day. Why would I ask for his favor if I expect it? I must expect and explore his favor and goodness every day. In all my circumstances, guys, in all my circumstances. We'll talk about promise and provision another day. I just think I need to say something about promise uh, to people who are waiting on promises. Uh, but we'll talk about promise and provision another time because I think just wrapping our heads around this is uh, head wrapping enough. Um, guys, um, God's promises are dynamite sticks of his goodness and favor. God's promises are basically dynamite sticks of goodness and favor. In each promise, each promise carries his heart. Each promise carries his heart towards you. Each promise announces his presence. Each promise guarantees an outcome. Please understand this, that when you go into the armory of the word, if you were to go into the armory of the word and you were to pick up dynamite sticks of promise, each promise is a dynamite stick of goodness and favor. So when you go digging into the word and you pull out these promises, know that those promises carry the heart of God towards you. Do not see them just as... Uh, Promises that can be used to affect my life. See them as the heart of God towards me. The proclamation of his presence into that situation. Emmanuel, God with me. And a guaranteed outcome because he is not a God who does not know how to come through. And as you begin to believe the promise, now that you have a different way of seeing it, so even though I may have uh, a pain in my left back or left shoulder, uh, the fact remains that the heart of God towards me is carried in the promise, hey, Jacob, my son was striped so that uh, you could receive my healing. Hey, Jacob, my name's Yahweh Rafa. Uh, I'm your healer. Hey, Jacob, my name's Yahweh Jaira. Or my name's Yahweh Rohi. Oh, hey, Jacob, uh, I'm, I'm someone who rises over you with um, healing in his wings. Hey, Jacob, just so you know, um, I send my word and I heal your disease. Um, hey, Jacob, just wanted you to know that uh, healing is the bread of, the ch of my children. Hey, Jacob, I wanted you to know that your body belongs to me. It's my property. I'm a good steward of what I look over. Hey, Jacob, I just want to heal you, not because of any of these promises, but because you're my son. Hey, Jacob, by the way, it's not promises that cause your healing. It's my compassion and power that cause my healing. It's moved. My power moves through the compassion I have for you because I just simply adore you. So when a promise begins to convey or carry the heart of God towards me, then it changes the way I approach a promise, guys. It then begins to proclaim or announce the presence of God into a situation. Suddenly into that situation, it's not a promise that is entering. It's not me repeating a scripture. We so often make scriptures so separate from God when it is always announcing his presence. And then the outcome is guaranteed. I mean, it's been guaranteed for the last 20, 29 or 30 or 32 years in my life. 
And now the same applies when you pray for someone else. If this release is how you bring yourself release, the same thing should now apply for others. Only now when you pray for others, your heart combines with God's heart so that the compassion of God, the desire of God, the power of God, the confidence of God, the favor of God begins to flow through a human person that the word becomes flesh through you. Release comes when I join with not a promise. Release comes not when I wield the scripture. Release comes when I join my heart with the heart of the Father whose favor I continuously enjoy. And now it's overflowing and spilling and affecting those around me. This is how we need to think if the remnant is supposed to become a people that seed release through the earth after the flood for the next little while. That's Chava. Amen. So, once we begin to believe a promise like this, then provision kicks in. Then provision kicks in. Each promise that is believed will have the consequence of provision. And provision will be contested, eh, guys? Provision will be contested. Provision will be contested. There is someone who tries to retard or hinder provision from coming to us. We have an active enemy. And when provision is contested, what do you do? You fall back again on the favor of God, on the goodness of God, on the heart of God, and the presence of God. Remember, I'll end, uh, I'll stop now. Remember that um, we are the only organization in the world that exists for the benefit of our non-members. And God wants to teach us how to bring this release. Go ahead, May. Uh, when the promise is not believed, uh, the provision can still come, but you won't enjoy the process. And uh, sometimes when the promise is not believed, the provision is delayed. Because when the provision is delayed, it's not because God is delaying it. It is because it's being contested. And when there is no contest, then it can get delayed till God himself intervenes. Let's assume it's like, it's like me wanting to give Don something and Derek does not want it to go to Don. And so I have given it, but Don doesn't receive it because Derek is um, preventing it from getting to Don. Up steps Jeevan, that mighty uh, man with an amazing muscular body. And he uh, decides, nope, this will be contested. And so he fights Derek down and he releases it. And so we need to contest. If you don't contest, things are delayed. God still comes through because if everything depended on my faith, hey guys, at the end of the day, use a promise as a battle axe, but use God's faithfulness as your shield. Use God's pr promise as a battle axe, but use God's trustworthiness or faithfulness as a shield. So that even if your battle axe is chopped, his trustworthiness will still bring it through. Sometimes we focus so strongly on our inadequacies and our deficiencies and our limitations that there's no way we'll get what we want because our faith may flounder, our trust may get shaken, our uh, knowledge of scripture may not be adequate, our lives may not be blazing pure, our, our thoughts and attitudes may be bitter. Our, our hereditary uh, garbage may be overwhelming. And in situations like that where you are not able to meet basic standards, fall back on the heart of God, the trustworthiness or the faithfulness of God, the presence of God, the ridiculous favor of God that you never deserved or earned but is given ungrudgingly simply because he adores you and upon the goodness of God. And the more you receive this, the more you'll want to be champion. That's a strange thing. Favor doesn't make you lazy. Favor makes you even more diligent. Favor doesn't make you lazy. I've seen that with your lives. If I favor you, I find that you don't say, well, now I don't need to do anything. Jacob favors me. Now it's like, ah, oh, shucks, wonder what he's going to ask me next. 
that is a bad example. It didn't go the way I was planning to. Anyways, Derek, go ahead. I'm done. So now I'm, I'm open to questions. I'm actually done, okay? Like I'm done. Yeah, go ahead. How do you contest for things? Um, you contest for things by one, like I said, using uh, the promise as a battle axe. You use your favor as uh, where you stand with God. You use his trustworthiness as a shield. And you use your constancy in moving forward in obedience as your diligence. So let me name those four things again. Diligent in my moving forward consistently. It's a secret to a successful Christian life. Consistency. Nothing else. Your gifts and all that stuff is just important glitter. But consistency is the key. Two, use the promise as a battle axe or a sword. Use his trustworthiness as my shield. Use the fact that he is that, that, that your God is good and that his favor upon you is tremendous. Use that as, your, uh, uh, as the posture or the position that you take. Because once I know how highly favored I am and how good God is, uh, my, my stance will be very different. Hey, um, you should see guys who turn up at uh, Chad's church. It's one of the largest churches in India. People yearn to preach there. And uh, they come dressed um, like it was their wedding. And um, then I'll go there, but because I have tremendous favor there, I I'll go there like this. Uh, perhaps my pants will be a little shabbier. And uh, uh, why? Because once you have favor, you know how to stand because of the tremendous favor you have. You got a different swagger. You got a different posture. You got a different position or a stance. You know that you can enter in and you have tremendous favor. Otherwise, you have to work for it. You got to dress for it. You got to speak a certain way. You got to work a certain way. Use these four things to contest. Any other question? Okay. So here's what. I want you to do, for any of you that are not well, uh, let's just pray for your healing. Let's just pray for your healing. And as you pray for your healing, let me ask these questions so that you put yourself in a really good position as you pray for healing. One, um, you do realize that as you approach God for healing, that you have the fullness of his permission to get everything that Christ did for you, right? That into your deficit, into your weakness, into your place of sickness, Christ's benefits yearn to enter. That Jesus Christ does not hold this back from you. That you have permission into the fullness of all that he is. That all that he is and has done is going to enter all that you are not and don't have. All that he is and has done is going to break into all that you are not and don't have. That's the idea of favor. You know that, right? As you approach him to seek healing for your pain. What about goodness? Open your eyes to the goodness of God. Open your eyes to the goodness of God. Your God is good. That's his glory. Your God is good. His goodness is not theory. His goodness wants to take shape, form. His goodness wants to be demonstrative. His goodness and his kindness are always demonstrated. Healing comes from the goodness and the kindness of God. Open your eyes to his goodness. Next. Think of the promise that you want to embrace right now. And let's go beyond healing. What other promises uh, are required to enter into your situation? Remember, his promise carries his heart towards you. Remember, his promise, when you receive it, brings his presence into your situation. 
and his presence has always changed situations. Remember that his promise carries his goodness. Remember that his promise guarantees an outcome. Don't look at how it will come to pass. Don't attempt to figure out how this promise will come to pass. And finally, release. God wants to bring release to you. The spirit of the sovereign Lord was upon him more than 2,000 years ago. He wants to bring release. You don't have to wait for the 50th year of Jubilee. He is Jubilee. He is here right now. He wants to bring me release. He wants to free my uh, lower back. He wants to free my shoulder. He wants to bring release. The Spirit of God brings all this to pass in our lives right now. From a place of absolute power, with Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. So now will you receive it? Guys, this is what I meant by thinking favor through. It takes time. And we usually don't afford ourselves the luxury of time to learn everything about the only one that can actually manage our lives, our good shepherd. We have time for everything else. So now, Father, having thought this through, We'll just take a minute or two to quietly receive your favor, your goodness, your promise, and release. All my life, you will be faithful. All my life, you will be so, so good. With everything that you are able. Your favor, Lord. I don't know the rest of the words. For this song, Father. So out of your goodness, Abba, I receive. I receive. Thank you. Okay, church, let's end with that song. I've been touched by a fire. I think Tate wanted the song, Good, Good Father, but uh, this is one of his other favorite songs, Tate. So enjoy as we sing. So as we sing this song, uh, may favor set you ablaze. Eh? May you walk in it for the rest of this year and then next year and the year after that. Grow in it. We'll talk about this more and more over the next few weeks. Blinded all my darkness, sparked my heart within. His grace and mercy lit a passion, consumed my sin. Sing that again. Jesus blinded.
deserve your favor. We don't deserve it. But we were so worth it for you. But we were so worth it for you. So Father, we say yes to opening our eyes to your favor. So that we look for it at every turn, at every corner, that we wake up into it, that we wake up into your love. Wake up into your goodness. We go to sleep recounting your trustworthiness, recounting your faithfulness. 
Father, may our every day be like that starting today. Father, it is my the cry of my heart, and I speak it for our church, Father. Father, I cannot wait to see how our lives will burn when we start to do this every single day. Father, may as we receive your favor and just grow into it, because like we learned your, your favor, the amount we receive doesn't change. But, Father, the more we pour out, the more we will receive. So let it just be a continuous fountain, continually flowing, Father. That's what you want Acts to do. You don't want it to stop. It is never meant to stop. It's never meant to stop. So thank you, Father. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for lifting us up. We give you all the praise and glory. In your son's name, amen.